Hi everyone, I'm Kristen, and welcome to the Murder and Myths podcast, Extended Mythology Episode 4A. Dear Plutarch, I have some corrections. Today we are going to talk about the Wasir myth from episode 4, Mummy Dearest, more commonly referred to as the Osiris myth, depending on whether you are using the more popular Greek name Osiris, or a translation of the Egyptian name Wasir. I struggled a lot on whether to use the Greek names for the Egyptian gods, or translations that more closely reflect the pronunciation of the people of ancient Egypt. For me, it was really an argument of accessibility versus accuracy, and there are valid arguments on each side. This wasn't the first time I've had this decision placed before me. In the case of Odin, from our first episode, I went with the pronunciation that is common in popular culture, when I could have called him Odin, which is closer to the way his name would have sounded from the culture in which he came. In ancient Egypt, the choice wasn't just a matter of slightly different pronunciations, but in some cases completely different names, as we see with Wasir versus Osiris. This is compounded further when we consider the main source of a cohesive narrative of this myth was written in the second century by the Greek scholar Plutarch, and he sometimes uses not just Greek names for the Egyptian gods, but sometimes calls them by the names of characters from Greek mythology. For example, in his story, he refers to Set as the Greek demon Typhon, which I think is somewhat responsible for a tendency of people to equate Set with a demon or devilish figure. Which is just one of the many issues with Plutarch's version, which we'll get to shortly. But first, back to the names. I decided that in this case, And going forward, whenever this issue presents itself, I'm going to refer to the characters, gods or otherwise, by the names the culture from which the myth originates gave them, to the best of my ability. I am not a linguist, and some of the character names, especially when we get to some of the South American myths, are going to trip me up. Uh, So let's dive into this story, and I'll address the names as they appear. As I stated, the main source of this myth comes from Plutarch. However, pieces of it do exist in several liturgical and funerary texts, ranging through a long time period in ancient Egypt. Like a lot of Egyptian mythology, we find bits and pieces scattered throughout temple inscriptions, preserved papyri, and various artifacts and those pieces need to be woven together to form a coherent story. So I do want to give credit to Plutarch for doing this. However, there is a lot that he included that can't be credited back to a primary Egyptian source, either because that information is lost to us, or, and in my opinion this is more likely, because it was his way of fitting the Egyptian pantheon into a Greek framework. To start, the birth of the five children of Geb and Newt, or, as Plutarch would tell it, Rhea and Kronos. If you're not familiar with the Greek story of Rhea and Kronos, basically they have six kids, Kronos is told that one of his children will overthrow him, so as they are born, he swallows them. Well, Rhea, with the help of Gaia and Uranus, comes up with a scheme to save one of the babies. Plutarch uses this story to influence his telling of the Egyptian myth, where he states that Ra has forbidden Newt to give birth, 
presumably because one of Newt's children will take the throne of Egypt from him. Plutarch also invents this soap opera-like love story between Jehudi and Newt that, well, just doesn't exist. And as such, I did not include it in my telling. Jehudi, who is more commonly called Thoth, or Thoth, I'm never quite sure on the pronunciation of that one, is referred to as Hermes in Plutarch's version. He is the god of wisdom in Egyptian mythology and does assist in the birth of Newt's five children. The story of Jehudi winning five days worth of light from Khonsu does two things. One, it helps explain the waxing and waning of the moon. Prior to the game with Jehudi, it is said that the moon shone almost as brightly in the night sky as the sun. But having lost five days worth of light, we now see the lunar cycle playing out mythologically. The second thing it explains is how we get from the 360 days in the regular Egyptian calendar to a more accurate 365-day calendar. These five extra days are added in between the normal days of the year and are referred to as the intercalary days, or the days upon the year. The birthdays of the five gods are celebrated on those days. As a recap, they are Wesir, Orosiris, Heruwer, also referred to as Horus the Elder or Herosis, Set, sometimes called Seth, Aset, called Isis, and Nebtet, whom the Greeks called Nephthys. This order is well known in Egyptian sources. Fast forward a bit to Wasir's rule and his marriage to Aset. We know that Wasir was associated with the title of Pharaoh or Nisut, but not a lot about his rule. Although in keeping with Wasir's associations with growing and planting seed and the order he represents, I will say I do approve of Plutarch's description of what a Wasir kingship might have looked like. However, this is where things really start going sideways. We do know that Wasir was killed by Set, specifically by drowning. There is so much symbology there that I think gets overlooked by all of the window dressing that Plutarch adds into the myth, with the story of the coffin and Set's 72 conspirators. Even though I really do love the idea of all of the Egyptian gods being excited about this coffin, and I wrote in the part about the gods trying it out a la Goldilocks, Again, I think all of that detracts from the reason Wasir dies and why it was his brother Set that killed him. So let's get into that now. I mentioned a little earlier that Wasir is associated with planting and growing seed, which is done in this very fertile and nutrient-rich soil that is left after the floodwaters of the Nile receded annually. This soil is very black, and it gives us the name of Egypt in the ancient tongue, Kemet, literally, the black land. On the other side, Set is associated with the desert. One of his titles, Neb Deshret, translates to Lord of the Desert. One of the things I noticed when I went to Egypt was the line of demarcation between the green, luscious, fertile land around the Nile and the empty, desolate sands of the desert. It is a very drastic line, like literally take one step and you're in a different land. I'll post up a couple of pictures from my trip on our website, murderandmist.com, to illustrate this. Now, let's roll back time before the Aswan Dam was built and the Nile still flooded annually. And let's imagine what the line of demarcation would do. The Nile would flood and leave behind all this beautiful black soil for planting all the food the Egyptians would be eating, the barley, emmer, lettuce, etc. You'd grow this food and harvest it and store it for the dry season. 
And as the year moved along, the desert would encroach, reclaiming the land and moving closer and closer to the banks of the Nile, until the floods came and pushed the desert back again. So just by the natural order of things, you see this struggle between the life-giving black land and the death of the desert, and these things get associated with the gods. And their struggle, the order and prosperity of Wasir, versus the disorder and chaos of Set, gets reflected in mythology and in the heart of this story. Set drowns Wasir in the same way the sand of the desert drowns the green land yearly. To be clear though, Set's chaos isn't the chaos of evil, or Isfet, embodied by the serpent Apep, who we will discuss on the next Extended Myth episode, but rather the chaos necessary to bring about change and evolution. Set's act here, wrapped up in treachery and betrayal by Plutarch, was critical to open the way for several other important things in Egyptian mythology. In this story specifically, it leads to the birth of Heru, who becomes very important as, spoilers, we'll see on the next podcast episode, and Wasir becoming ruler of the Duat. So, in addition to the whole coffin thing being made up, as I mentioned in the reaction segment of episode 4, the coffin floating to Byblos, and Aset traveling there, was all Plutarch's addition to the story. One theory is he added this in to explain why there was a temple to Wasir in Syria. For me, this whole portion seems to be geared to further syncretizing the Egyptian story to Greek mythology. Because of this, I left a lot out in my retelling of the tale, like the part where Aset becomes a wet nurse to one of the sons of the Queen of Byblos, and tries to make him immortal by engulfing him in flame to burn away the immortal parts. This is similar in a way to the Greek story of how Theatis, mother of Achilles, tries to make him immortal. Aset also ends up killing both sons of the king and queen of Byblos. One who died because of Aset's wailing when she fell upon Wasir's coffin after it had been removed from the pillar. The other, whom she took as a hostage from Byblos, died when she gave him the evil eye after he caught her stroking the face of her dead husband's corpse. The reason I left in what I did was because I did like and appreciate the tree being raised as a pillar, like the Dejed pillar, which was associated with Wasir, and a symbol of resurrection. The dismemberment of Wasir is also a point of contention. Plutarch includes it and goes on to say that the reason there are so many temples to Wasir is one was raised in each place a part of his body was found, and that Aset built them to confuse Set as to where Wasir's body is actually buried. In some places, Wasir's body is never dismembered, except for the phallus being missing and eaten by a fish. There is also some interesting symbology here, because Set is associated with the Medjed fish, a species of elephant fish, whose snout looks quite a bit like Set's actually. Check out the pictures on our website. So maybe, rather than an actual Nile-dwelling fish consuming the phallus of Wasir, this is just further symbolic of Set overpowering the renewal that Wasir represents in order to facilitate room for a new source to step into that role. We do know from Egyptian sources that Aset, Neptet, and Yinipu, better known as the jackal-headed god Anubis, sometimes with the help of Ra and Jehudi, mummified Wasir to prepare his body for the afterlife. Aset does impregnate herself with Wasir's seed, although, unlike the Plutarch story where he is temporarily brought back to life to perform his manly duty, the Egyptian sources indicate this was done with magic. 
Wasir goes on to become king of the Duat, the place of the Egyptian afterlife, which is important. It's a way of letting people know that even in death, they will still have a connection and blessings from the gods, as Wasir will be present with them there, and there will be order. So that brings us to the end of the Wasir myth as told in episode 4. Before I sign off, I posed a question on Twitter about what the set animal is, and I just wanted to share a few of the answers I got. As you recall during the reaction segment of episode 4, I said Set was some type of exaggerated desert canine, although after seeing the Majed fish, I think I might change my answer to a hybrid fish dog. Kim suggested it was an anteater, and this seemed to be the most popular description for Set. The Lord Fu, co-host of the Sad Dads podcast, agreed with her, saying, it's an anteater, baby, yeah, which I only hear in an Austin Powers voice, although I can't pull off an Austin Powers impression for you. Zodiac KMAK also went with this pick. On a side note, if you're interested in the Zodiac killings and want a closer look at the ciphers and suspects, uh, check out the blog at ZodiacKMAK.com. Despite an anteater being the most popular interpretation of Set's look, I don't think there were any anteaters in ancient Egypt, unless we are going to dive into some Giorgio de Sokolis ancient aliens theory, but there is probably another podcast for that. Eli Drums says it's clearly an evolved pterodactyl. Uh, looking at the ears and adding in Set's forked tail, I could see that. He does ride the boat of millions of years in the sky, so maybe that's what he does now that he lost his wings. Pocket of Crim, or Crime, not quite sure how to pronounce that, uh, host of the Between the Profound and the Profane podcast, pointed out that while these animals mostly live in Central America and Asia now, maybe the set animal is an extinct tapir. I do have to say the resemblance there is very striking. If you have any more theories, please let me know. I'm also open to any questions, suggestions, or corrections you may have. You can always send us an email to murderandmyths at gmail.com or reach out on Twitter at murderandmyths. Join us next week for episode five it's all fun and games until someone loses an eye. And as always, come for the murder and stay for the myths. <laughs>